Good morning, New Life Church. How's everyone this morning? Hey, did you all notice something that I noticed uh, in the first service and saw it again the second one that we had pretty much an all girl worship team this morning? Did you know? And Eli. Did you notice? And Eli. So. Nice work, Eli. I challenged everyone at the beginning of the first service to come up with a name for that band that's all girls and Eli. So, so far the winner is like Girl Power Eliance or something. Someone came up to me after the first one. So, nice job on that. Hey, uh, before we preach in all seriousness, I do want to just take a moment and uh, offer up a, a word of prayer for our communities right now in the surrounding region. If you haven't noticed, it's a little soggy out there. We got a ton of water, and uh, some of us fared just fine, and others are truly suffering today with uh, some extreme flooding, uh, whether it's just in their personal homes or their entire communities, if we go just a little bit uh, outside of our area here. So can we just take a quick moment and offer up a word of prayer for our community and those that have been deeply affected by this? Let's pray. Lord, as we gather this morning as the body of Christ, you have told us that where two or three are gathered in your name, that you are there in their midst. And we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. We are here to worship and to honor you. And we thank you that you hear us when we pray. We thank you that you are sovereignly on your throne and that nothing takes you by surprise. There's no event in our life that takes you by surprise. And yet, Lord, we know that there are many people around us today who have been truly impacted by the weather events of this, um, this last week. And for some, Lord, that poses significant challenges, financially, physically. And uh, our prayers are with them this morning, Lord, that you would just work through this very difficult time to show yourself real and strong. Might this be an opportunity in communities all around for the body of Christ to mobilize and to be light in a dark world and to offer hope and help and so father i pray that even here and now you would help us recognize our place in that for some of us it could literally be responding with uh, physical help that others need lord for others it, it might be financial help that we're in a position to give to someone in need lord there's business owners among us that have businesses that can provide services and be called upon for that and so whatever that may look like i pray that you would even inspire us here in this place to go out and be a part of those helping hands that bring the love of jesus to those that need it this morning so father we just pray your your hand of protection and favor and blessing upon our area and we pray these things in the mighty name of jesus and all god's people said amen amen, amen. for some of you this may be the time to go buy that boat that you've been thinking about so uh, take it on a missions trip or something like that 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 wasn't from the lord that was from me right there so all right, so I've got a question for you this morning, and it's what we call a rhetorical question. I don't have the time to go around and give everyone the microphone and, and get your personal answer to this, but I'm going to challenge you to think about this, and so rhetorical just means you don't yell out the answer. Just think to yourself. When you were younger, many years ago for some of us, we have to go further back than others, when you were younger and you thought about what you wanted to be when you got older, what was it? What did you dream about doing, being? What did you dream about for a career someday when you were older? Nice job on the whole rhetorical part. Inevitably, someone always hollers out something to me, but you guys, that's great. Uh, here's, here's a question, and you're welcome to give me an answer on this one. What do you think young people today overwhelmingly dream about becoming for their job, for their career when they get a little bit older. What do you think is kind of the top job for young people today? I've heard multiple people holler out YouTuber. And uh, you, how many of you remember a day when YouTuber would have been like a name we called somebody, right? Like, what's a YouTuber? Uh, it's a real thing today. And listen to this statistic. A study by the Pew Research Center found that 50 Four percent of teens aged 13 to 17 aspire to be social media influencers. Now, I want to be really clear to say this real quick. Young people, I'm not picking on you. I'm not even mad about that, that, 54, that over half of you want to be social media influencers. I don't have a problem with that, and I'm, I'm not preaching a sermon against being a YouTuber. 
As a matter of fact, I'll go a step further to say this, young people and old people, because there's old people on YouTube as well. You can go find them. They're there. But I would say this. God created us to be creators, and so I'm not mad if you desire to be a content creator. My challenge to you would be to create something that is adding value to the world. If you want to be an influencer, have a, a message worth influencing other people in, amen? So add value, and as long as you're doing that, I'm, I'm, I don't mind the fact that you want to be a YouTuber or a social media influencer or a content creator. When I was younger, this is hard to believe for some of you, there was no internet, there was no YouTube, there was no content creators, at least not the way we think of them today. So I want to be clear about that. I'm not mad at young people who want to be social media influencers, but here's what I do want to point to. I think the fact that over half of teenagers today desire to be an influencer points to something that is deep in all of us that can be very unhealthy. So I'm not just picking on the young people. I think the fact that there is a strong desire among humanity to be an influencer says that somewhere in most of us, probably all of us, there is a desire to be known, to, to maybe have that instant overnight success, to have the fame that might come along with that. Certainly the money, I think the, the finances are part of it, but I think it goes so much deeper than the money, if we're honest. I think for many, man, if, if just... if. If I had to fight cameras and paparazzi when I walked out on the street, how cool would that be to have people know who I am? Because all the introverts are like, that would be horrible. But the extroverts are like, tell me more. Where do I sign up for this? Because at, at a deeper level, none of us would probably say this out loud, but there's power to be had in that, is there not? There's power. And again, I'm not saying that it's inherently wrong to, to be a, an influencer, but we ought to be careful about that desire to go viral. We're in a series right now where we are looking at some of the different ways that Jesus was tempted. How many of you know that Jesus faced temptations just like you and I face? Because while Jesus was and is 100% God, and a member of the triune Godhead between services, someone was asking me, what is this? How does the triune Godhead work? I was like, man, if you can explain that, you should write a book and make lots of money. I said, it's the Trinity is a word not found in Scripture, but it's a concept that we see, one God in three persons. And on a human level, I can't fully wrap my brain around how that even works, but we see it in Scripture. There is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is the Son of God. He is God. He came to this earth on a great rescue mission to redeem mankind back into right relationship with the God who created us. And in that time that Jesus walked this earth, he was still 100% fully God, but he also took on the cloak of humanity, and he was 100% man. Now, again, that math doesn't necessarily math unless it's supernatural, right? Right? But we believe that Jesus suspended some of his divine attributes while he was in human form here on this earth. And what we know and see in scripture is that just like you and me, Jesus faced temptation of all different kinds. And that's kind of encouraging because I will follow a leader who is smoking what they're selling. I will follow a leader who tells me what to do, who's been where he's telling me to go, and he knows what I'm going through. I can trust that kind of a leader, and that's who Jesus is. He knows what it is to be tempted. And in our time together today, I want to look at a, a little blip of Scripture where I'm going to make a case that Jesus faced the temptation to go viral. Not through YouTube, go viral when we were young that like when i was a kid if something went viral people were dying right like that was a disease that was spreading across humanity now it's a good thing to go viral jesus had an opportunity essentially to have the fast track to instant fame power recognition and control and we're going to see how he handles this and and take some applications for our life as well let me give you the context and then we're going to jump into the story here okay john chapter 6 so there's a time where Jesus is, is one of the miracles that he does. He feeds thousands of people. But if we back up a little bit even from that, Jesus had just learned that John the Baptist, his cousin and, and friend, had been beheaded. 
And, and Jesus is trying to get his disciples to a quiet, solitary place, probably for grief, if, if anything, and processing that, and to be alone with them, and to pour into the, his disciples, and the crowds follow them. The crowds find Jesus, and, and they show up. And rather than Jesus saying, get out of here, we're trying to have a moment, he loves them, he serves them, he teaches them, he feeds them, because it's starting to get late, and the disciples come to Jesus, and they're like, hey, we got a problem, all these people are hungry, Taco Bell just closed, we got no food for anybody, what are we going to do, and Jesus says, find how much food is available, and there's a very limited amount of fish and loaves, have you all heard this story, and Jesus takes this very limited supply, and in the hands of Jesus, our supply is more than enough, amen? Because he starts to just multiply and multiply, and it, Scripture says he fed 5,000 men, which means there were probably double that when you start adding in the women and the children. So there's this huge crowd of people where Jesus does this awesome fish and chips buffet, and everybody eats until they're full. There's 12 basketfuls of leftovers for tomorrow, and this is where we're going to pick up the story, okay? John chapter 6, verse 14. It says, After the people saw the sign that Jesus performed, that, that miraculous multiplication of food, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. They had heard about this Messiah, that it had been foretold that this person was going to come and deliver God's people back to their back to their best days ever and they were waiting for it and all of a sudden here's this person who's preaching and teaching with power and authority and he's healing people and he can even feed us when we're hungry this is awesome and look what it says next verse 15 jesus knowing that they intended to come and make him king by what force. by force withdrew again to a mountain by himself now, quick little side note here, church. There are so many powerful things in Scripture that are very easy to just go blowing right past when you're reading the Bible. Like my daily Bible reading, I usually read a few chapters a day as part of a you know Bible reading plan, and it's very easy to like just blow right past a detail like that, but we're just going to slow down today because there's a lot happening in these two verses. Jesus had a crowd of people that recognized the fact that this is probably the Messiah. He's the one, and they wanted to make him king by force. For a long time when I would read that, I just thought in my mind, like, and I never really meditated on this. I never really gave it a lot of consideration. I just thought when it said by force, that this was a group of people that wanted to force Jesus to be our king. You're going to do what we say. You're going to be our king. But that's not what's happening here. So again, a little bit more context will, will help us really grasp what's going on in this story. So if I could take us in a time machine back to first century Judea, here's a few really important things we need to understand about this crowd of people. Israel right now is under occupation by the Roman government. And, and this is really hard for us to put ourselves in those sandals as, you know, multi-generation American people who have been born and raised in a relatively free land. It's really hard for us to contemplate what, imagine if you can, what life would be like and how, how cloudy your, and gloomy your outlook on the world would be if this week sometime some foreign nation invades the United States of America, overthrows our government, and imposes their system of government upon us. I have a feeling Americans wouldn't sit by for that. At least half of us would probably be willing to, to rise up and go, oh, no, you don't. Like, we've fought some wars over this stuff before, amen? And, and this Roman government is heavily taxing these people. So to say that they're sick and tired of being sick and tired would be an understatement. They're ready for revolt. Add to that the fact that there's widespread poverty in this time. Most people are not doing very well financially. And how many of you know that some of the most desperate people are those who have nothing else to lose? 
My back's against the wall and I have nothing else to do but fight at this point. And that's kind of, there's a boiling happening in this culture right now. There is just a a waiting for a match to be lit, to light off some kind of a revolution. And there's a mass of humanity that has been gathered. They have been fed. They have been witness to the fact that there is something really special and powerful about this one who just fed us this meal. And they are basically saying, we're, we're willing to go to war for you. The force, so here's the point. When, they, when it talks about they wanted to make Jesus king by force, the force was not their will being exerted on to Jesus. It was their force being exerted for Jesus. Does that make sense? Basically, Jesus had at his disposal an angry mob that would have said, whatever you need, we're here for it. Jesus, you need an uprising? We're your crowd. You need a political protest? We're here for it. You want us to assemble some kind of a militia and go toe-to-toe with the Roman authorities? Sign us up. You are going to be our king, and whatever our king wants, you have the power, you have the control, you have the throne. Tell us what to do. Give us our marching orders. Now, I ask you again, how many of you are like, that actually sounds like a pretty good deal. I want to be king. Don't look at me with those spiritual eyes like you wouldn't want that. Deep down, most of you are like, that would be awesome to get to be king like that. And Jesus had it offered to him on a silver platter. And the very next thing it says is that Jesus went by himself to a mountainside to be alone. So he clearly says no thank you to an opportunity that was presented to him to have immediate access to the power, to the influence, to the fame, to the recognition, to the control. And I just want to dig into this a little bit and and point out a few other maybe nuances of this as we think about the, the impact of what Jesus did and what he did not do in this moment. So if you're a note taker, here's one thought that comes to mind. Preachers have to put this stuff in numbers of three. So here's number one. Are you ready? Jesus chose God's plan over the crowd's expectation. There's two different elements at work here. There is a plan from the Father in heaven that is being executed, and then there's the expectations of this crowd of people. Now, if you missed last week's sermon, I'm challenging you, go online and listen to it, watch it. Pastor Alex did an amazing job of pointing out the scripture where uh, Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was to be crucified. And remember, there was the human side of Jesus that was more and more resistant to the plan. There was a plan in place, the plan between God the Father and God the Son for thousands of years in in eternity past had been set in motion that redemption, salvation is coming to mankind through the suffering, the death, the burial and the resurrection of my precious one and only son, the spotless lamb of God. There was a plan. Remember last week, Pastor Alex quoted the great theologian, Mike Tyson, who says, everyone has a plan until you're punched in the face. And as the time for that execution of the plan got closer, the human side of Jesus is, Father, if there's any other way, if we can come up with plan B, let's do that instead of this. Can you blame him? And here is plan B being offered up to Jesus. Hey, guess what? You, how about you just take the throne? You've got an angry mob of people ready to exert their will by force on your behalf. You don't have to do the suffering part of all of this. You can just be the king right now. And Jesus chose God's plan over the expectations of the crowd. How many of you know that God has a plan for your life? I know that sounds cliche if you've been in Christian circles for any length of time, because you've probably heard that more than just a couple times, but it's not cliche, it's true. If you're here this morning, if you have a heart beating in your chest and lungs rising and expanding with, with every breath, that is evidence that there is a God in heaven who created you and he has a plan for your life. There are some things he wants to do in you, with you, through you. He wants to make an impact in the world. He has a plan for your life. But here's the other truth. 
There are countless other people around you that also have expectations for your life, and a lot of times those two do not line up. Sometimes the enemy is more than happy to put the expectations of others in front of you as a distraction to pull you off course from the plan that God would love for you to be executing on his behalf. Sometimes the voice of the enemy sounds an awful lot like your mother-in-law. And you can go tell her the pastor said that. Pastor said that you're the devil. No, I didn't say that. I just said that sometimes there are people in our lives who have expectations for us that are not in alignment with the plan that God has. And sometimes we have to make a choice. Am I going to follow the plan that God has for my life or am I going to give in to the pressure of the crowd of people around me who have their expectations for what my life should look like? Young people, some of you, that could be the voice of a parent saying you need to go to college and get a degree when you know God has put it in your heart to be a YouTuber. I just created a hectic lunch for some of you today. Like, but mom, the pastor said I can be a YouTuber. Maybe you can. Maybe you need to go to college. I don't know. But how do we know the difference, by the way? This is why it is so important to be in a daily walk with the lord jesus christ and listening to the voice of his spirit amen because he and by the way to surround yourself with godly wise counsel because he will guide and direct a heart who's yielded to him and saying lord show me what you want for my life show me what step you want me to take and then i'm telling you i'm telling you i'm telling you when you are walking in that plan god's plan for your life you are going to have a moment or many moments where you have to make a choice to disappoint some people in your life who have other plans for your life and have other expectations. And I'm very grateful that Jesus was willing to disappoint the expectations of the masses of people around him in that moment, the hype of the mob. And he was willing to say, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say no thank you to that. I'm actually gonna go up on a mountain by myself. He was willing to choose God's plan over the crowd's expectations. Number two, Jesus chose long-term impact over immediate gratification. How many of you know that when it comes to food, the best food, the good food, is stuff that takes time to process and to cook? Did you, know, did you all know that? Like, what comes out of a crock pot is way better than what comes out of a microwave, amen? You believe that? That's true, because long-term, doing it for the long-term is way better than the short, immediate gratification of a microwave. And we live in a culture that wants crockpot results with microwave input, right? Like, give me the best, but, but give it to me quick. Like, just give it to me now. And Jesus had a microwave opportunity. He had the microwave results ready for him. You don't have to play the long game, Jesus. You can just take the immediate path to the throne that's being offered right here. Just follow the expectations of the masses, and you can be the king. They're going to use their force to force the plan, Jesus. Just take the microwave approach. And Jesus chose long-term, eternal impact versus the short-term immediate gratification how cool would that have been in that moment if jesus would have been like yeah let's just mobilize we're attacking the roman headquarters tonight like let's go like that would have been a really cool story and made a great movie and the rest of us would be lost for all eternity because the plan would not have been executed amen think about this imagine and i don't have any evidence of what was going through the mind of jesus that night but Imagine Jesus later that night by himself on a mountain. Maybe he's got a little campfire there, but he's thinking about the events of the day, right? Like I would be. He's sitting there thinking, wow, that was a wild day. That was awesome. We took a little bit of food, fed thousands of people, shook a lot of hands. That was a great sermon I preached today. Man, the crowd, they wanted to make me king by force. And here I'm sitting all by myself in obscurity, where no progress is taking place. Choosing long-term impact often puts us in a place of obscurity where it feels like there's no progress being made today. Nothing good happened today. But so often when we are following God's plan for our life, it's almost never immediate gratification. It's almost always the long game. 
I'm curious if there's some areas in your life where you need to be choosing long-term impact instead of immediate gratification. I know there's areas in our life where we are so tempted to go for the microwave option. Microwave marriage. You know what a microwave marriage is? It's the marriage where when things get difficult, we go, I'm not happy anymore, and I know God wants me to be happy, so I'm out. I'll go find the one who makes me happy instead of long-term impact. Stay in it. Go through the suffering. Go through the dark valley. Endure. Lean into what is God teaching me in this season? I thought it was all about how much my spouse needed to change. What is it that God's trying to change in me? How about parenting? Microwave parenting. Man, I just want my kids to turn out. Well, I got news for you. you you're going to have your kids at least about 18 years, if I'm doing the math right. And, and they don't turn out right away. Am I speaking to any parents that are in the thick of parenting battles right now? Like it could be three-year-old, it could be eight-year-old, it could be 13-year-old, but you've had so many moments where you're just like, I want to quit. I don't think I'm that good of a parent, and I think my kids are brain damaged anyway. Like this isn't working. I want out. Why didn't these kids come with a return policy, Lord? Like how do I give them back? You say they're a gift. Where's the return department? It's the long game. It's the long game. It's not microwave parenting that produces world-class seven-year-olds. It's the long game of parenting. You're not raising kids, you're raising adults, and it takes a while to see the fruit of your labor pay off. Go for the long-term impact and not immediate gratification. For some of you, it could be in the area of your finances. You keep showing up and getting broke a little bit more each day as you give the gas station another eight bucks for lottery tickets because you want the instant microwave make me rich today state of south dakota lottery baby today's the day the long-term impact could instead look like you pouring into your business another day when it doesn't feel like there's success when it doesn't feel like there's anything happening when this feels so obscure when i'm not seeing the results that i want it's long-term impact over short-term immediate gratification. How long is eternity? You want to you do a little trippy mental exercise? See, for us as humans, we were born into time. There was a date and time that we were born. There will be a date and time that we leave this earth, and everything in between is measured by the ticking of a clock every single second. We time stamp everything. So for what I'm getting ready to say next, this just gets so trippy. Imagine if you can go as far back in time as absolutely possible and then keep going where you break the clock and go as far back into eternity past realizing you're never going to get to a beginning and God is already there without a beginning he's eternal and if we can get in that same time machine and speed as far and fast as we can to the other end of the time spectrum and blow through that end and go as far as you can out into eternity you're never going to hit the end and God is still there he is eternal and did you know that you and I were created for eternity, that God has put eternity into the hearts of men? And even though our physical lives have a born on and an end on date, we were made for eternity. And had Jesus chosen immediate gratification, we miss out on eternity. The fact that those of us who have claimed Christ as our Lord and Savior and received forgiveness, that was only made possible because Jesus was willing to endure the plan of God, the suffering that he had to go through in order to be crucified, buried, and to rise again victoriously from the dead, proving himself worthy to defeat sin and restore us into a, a right relationship with the Father. And had he taken this temptation if you will to go viral in the moment we miss out on eternal impact play the long game I, I find myself often as i'm encouraging people whether it's in their marriage their parenting their financial pursuits play the long game and sometimes i need people to speak that into my life as well because hi my name's john and i like my microwave i like things fast i don't like waiting in line Yesterday, 
we were driving home. Our family had been in Kansas City for a family reunion and had to come up on Interstate 29. And there's a ton of flooding. Parts of the interstate were shut down. So we had to do this long kind of detour around to get back north to, to Flandreau where we live. And uh, at one point, we found ourselves in like one of the only open highways around here that was open going north. And we are in this long line of traffic. And if you know me, you know I do not like long lines for anything. And we're waiting, and we're waiting, and we're waiting. And I'm sitting going, what is causing this snail pace? I'm ready to... I'm ready to, to do some things by force by the time I get up here and realize all it is, if we just had one person directing traffic, one person just to like stop traffic here and here and then let about a mile of us get out, we could fix everything. And if I did not have my wife in the car with me, I swear to goodness, I would have stopped and directed traffic myself. I even said to Jess, you know how much fun it'd be just to block this lane and to get out with authority and be like, stop, y'all are waiting. And then just start letting the masses come out like, if she would not have been with me, I would probably still be directing traffic at that intersection right now. I was so mad. I hate waiting. It's the long game. Unless you're in traffic, then let's figure out a way to speed this thing up. That wasn't in my notes. I just needed some therapy there, so thank you. All right, the last thing I want to point out is this. Jesus chose divine purpose over earthly power. And again, he had an option. He had the option in front of him. You can take earthly power. You can take the reins. And imagine this, the people, what they wanted, they wanted a military leader. The mob, what they wanted was a political figure. And it's easy for us just to look at that and go, how foolish. And yet the truth is, I'm not naming names or pointing fingers, but there are people in the sound of my voice that all of your hopes for this nation are riding on what happens this November with our election. You think if I can just get my guy into the Oval Office or my gal into the Oval Office, we're going to save America. Listen, if you're like 23 or younger, I will grant you your naive bliss. But if you are anything older than that, you should have been around long enough to see how this thing works. Hope for this nation is not coming through the Oval Office or Congress or the courts. I'm not saying we shouldn't show up and have our voices heard. We should, yes and amen. But I'm telling you, hope for this nation does not arrive on Air Force One. And the next election is not fixing anything. Hope for this nation does not come through elephants or jackasses. I love saying that from the pulpit. So you just let that land wherever you want it to land. But that's what the people wanted. They wanted a political figurehead. They wanted a military leader in Jesus. Why? Because they wanted earthly power. And Jesus could have stepped into that earthly power and said, let's roll. Let's do this thing. If Jesus would have helped them in that moment see the kingdom that he was coming to establish, make no mistake about it, Jesus was coming to establish a kingdom. But it wasn't going to look like what they wanted. Because in Jesus' kingdom, he turned so much on its head, and he says ridiculous things like this. Y'all want to be great? Whoever wants to be great here today, you want to talk about influencing some people? How about this, YouTubers? Whoever wants to be great must become the least of all and become a servant. You want to be first? Be last. And it just dawned on me in the last service as I said that, according to that math, the Minnesota Vikings are champions after all. Amen? You want to be first, be last. That makes no sense, Jesus. What are you talking about? Be, you want to be great, serve other people. When attacked, instead of responding with violence, turn the other cheek. When someone takes something from you, give them the other. Give them more. Like, this is Jesus' kingdom. And it makes no sense to those of us who want earthly power. How about this one? Where we seek control, he would say surrender. And that'll preach to some hearts here today, will it not? Because I don't know about you, but there's areas of my life, pretty much every area of my life, I want control. And I want to be clear, I do have control and responsibility over the choices I make, amen? Like I'm not, I don't want to, what I'm getting ready to say next to make it sound like we're all just victims of anything that happens to us. I am 100% responsible for the choices I make and the thoughts I think, and so are you, true? Having said that, that's about where my control stops. And there's so much more to be controlled, Jesus. Who's going to control all of them? 
and all of that. There's so much I want to control and, and so little I have control over. And in his kingdom, he says, how about you surrender? How about you stop fighting for power? How about you let off the reins and let me have them? I'm curious what area of your life you're fighting for control and power when the kingdom of God would say, surrender. I don't want to surrender. I want control. I want power. But see, here's the thing. I want to share this with you. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. The prophet says this. The Lord says through the prophet Isaiah, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. In other words, this is God saying to us, I'm, I do a much better job at being God than you do. I know so much more than you. He goes on to say, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. I'm God and you're not. I have an eternal perspective that you can't even begin to understand. I have a kingdom with values that you don't even begin to understand. And it is this kingdom that I came to establish, not the earthly kingdom with power that you want me to lead. I had someone, we had a great conversation after in, in between services come up to me. And I'm just going to say it because this is real. It wasn't like an argument. It was a genuine conversation. Man, what do you do? with someone who has done the most unthinkable thing to children. Are you telling me God would forgive them? Like that is so, I, I want earthly power because I, I have some thoughts of what we should do to those people who pray on the most innocent among us. And bro, I am right there with you. But I said, see, here's the thing though. That's what makes grace so scandalous. And hear me clearly. I'm not saying all pedophiles are going to heaven. I am not saying that. I'm saying, thank God that he is the one that is on the judge's seat and not me because he sees things that I, I don't see. If there is genuine repentance from any heart, regardless of what has been done, but for the grace of God, there go I. And see, we're okay with grace when it's being applied to me. I don't know if I'm so okay with grace when it's given to someone that honestly I'd like to string up from a tree. But see, in God's kingdom, he went to the tree on my behalf and on the behalf of all sin in all humanity. And that's what makes amazing grace so scandalous. That God would step into the lives of sinful humanity and take upon himself all of our wrong and offer anyone forgiveness who would repent of their sin and turn toward him and receive him. Wow. His kingdom is so different than the kingdom I would set up. Because in my kingdom, there would be some people hanging from trees. There would be some earthly power and vengeance taking place. And thank God that John's not God, amen? Thank God that Jesus is a much better God and judge than John is. And so he chose divine purpose over earthly power, and he had it at his disposal to take the reins of that earthly power. See, there's a lot happening in this little brief passage of Scripture, is there not? They intended to make Jesus king by force. And Jesus said, actually, I'm, I'm going to go up on the mountain by myself because the purpose, the plan, I've got something bigger. I've got a bigger kingdom. Long-term impact, eternal impact, not the short-term immediate gratification that you're seeking to give me. By the way, had Jesus responded to that, what we know about the mob is that just as quickly as they get riled up, they will turn on you just that fast, amen? So, YouTubers, influencers, the same people giving you the likes and the follows today will be the same people throwing all kinds of shade at you tomorrow. Don't live for the approval of the mob. Don't live for the expectations of the mob because they will change so quick. And Jesus, in his wisdom, chose well, and he faced the temptation that would have been very easy for most of us to go, I'll take that. I'll take the easy path. I'll take the immediate path that's in front of me to the throne. Guys, I don't know where this lands with you today, but here's what I do know. 
I know that the Holy Spirit is here in this moment, and I know he's speaking to hearts right now. And I know he is talking to you about things that I have not said any word about. And what you need to know is when that happens, that is the Holy Spirit directly talking to you and saying, this is for you. And so I'm going to ask, heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. Here's my question to you right now this morning, church. What is God saying to you in this moment? What is the surrender that he is calling you to make? What is the long-term battle that he's calling you back into when it would be so easy just to quit and give up? What is the plan that he's inviting you to follow him in and at the same time asking you to disappoint some people around you that have other plans and other expectations for what your life ought to look like? Father, in this moment, I'm grateful that uh, you've given us an opportunity to gather in this place as your people, and I'm thankful for the example that Jesus has set where time and again he faced very real temptation, the same kind of stuff that we go through every single day. Jesus faced temptation, and at every point he won. And I'm grateful for that example, and I'm grateful that he can now call us to follow him, to live for him, to surrender to him. Jesus, thank you for being a good leader. Thank you for being a safe leader that we can trust and follow. I pray, God, if there's anyone here today that has never trusted you as Lord and Savior, that today would be their day of surrender. For some, that may be the battle. It is surrendering to your authority and inviting you to be the Lord of their life. I pray that would happen as a result of this message today. Jesus, do your work. Lord, you see every life represented in this place. You know every story. You know every detail of every human heart. And I pray in this moment that you would just be speaking powerfully to our situations and that you would be finding open, receptive hearts of yielded obedience, willing to follow. We'll give you all the praise and the honor and the glory for how you use this message in the lives of your people this week, Jesus. We love you. It's in your precious and powerful name we pray these things. And God's people said... Amen. Guys, thank you. Thanks for tuning in to New Life Sermon Series Online. If you're blessed by these messages and are interested in helping spread the word of God to others, make an investment today. You can give at newlifechurchsf.org. If you have a story or a testimony to share, let us know on our website as well. We hope you have a blessed day and enjoy today's message by Pastor Alex.